Have any one of you ever tried to run away from home when you were a kid? Okay, the honest people in the room, all right? I, I, don't, I was thinking about this for a second. I thought, when I was a kid, did I ever like, look at my parents and say, I don't want to live here anymore, I'm going to run away? And because I was such a great child, I never did that. But um, <laughs> just kidding. Mom, Dad, if you're watching, you can put in the comments when I actually tried to run away. I think for me, the idea is I'd probably like, get out of the house and realize they never came after me. I'm like, well, this is lame. Like, I, I'm doing that so they would show attention, and they never did. But recently at our house, um, just to let you know that, you know, Pastors have problems with their kids, too. Um, My oldest son, um, within the last few months, was like, you know what, Dad? I don't want to live here anymore. I'm going to leave. And I'm like, all right, fine, go. You know, I did what my parents did. Fine, go. I don't care. You know, have fun, right? So no more video games, no more little stuffed animals at bedtime. Go, go on out. Go have fun. He goes, fine, I'm going to go. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll unlock the van for you. (laughs) Um, And he started the van and drove into the... No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) So, I'm, so as he walks out the door, we, our, our house is situated to the point where I can kind of go out into the little side room and I can sit and watch. And I see him watching. He goes into the car, into the van, I think at the time. And, and he starts, you know, kind of turning the steering wheel and trying to like haunt the horn. And, and I'm like, I'm not going to go out there. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of waiting. I'm like, well, you know, what's he doing? You know, how far is he going to get, you know? And, um, but this, because we live in a cul-de-sac, we have like very amazing, good neighbors. Like the neighbor across the street saw him get in the car and realized like no one came out. So she like comes out of her house and, and tries to walk over and she walks like up to the door. And at this point, like I'm like, well, now I look like a horrible parent, right? So, <laughs> so I open the door and go out. No, 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 no. He's running away from home. She's like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, I was watching the whole time. She's like, oh, okay. I just, you know, didn't want him to get locked in. I get apparently kids getting locked in cars is not a good thing. All right. And, um, and so I was like, no, no, I got it the whole time, right? And I was just sitting back there going, oh, how far are you going to get? Huh? What, what point are you? He never really broke. I had to go out because I didn't want to look like a bad parent. And I had to stop it. And uh, so and, and because he knows in our house that I frequently say no to things he asks. In fact, it's like, Dad, I'm like, no. And now, he, now he's at the point on a ride back um, from Sacramento last week. He said, Dad. And I said, no. He goes, you always just say no. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I just wanted to tell you I love you. And I was like, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, yes, pastors' homes have kids and conflicts with kids. But the whole idea of running away from home is really hoping to set the scene because Jonah in our story runs away from God. And we're going to be spending, um, it took us a year to go through Mark, and there was only 16 chapters. There's only four chapters in Jonah, so we should be here for about four months or three months. Um, <laughs> we'll go word by word and stretch it out just to, you know, changes the culture here, but no. We're going to be four weeks in the book of Jonah. If you don't get that joke, because maybe you're new, we'd spent, I guess, 51 weeks, the whole year going, a little over a year going through the book of Mark, and now we're going to go through the book of Jonah, but there's only four chapters, and if we were to break it up and kind of go so small, you kind of get the, the story that should be read in about five minutes if you are a fast reader. If you're like me, it'll take you an hour, but Anyway, we're going to go through the book of Jonah together. So if you're new to your Bibles, you can open up and kind of go to the right. If you find Psalms in the middle, like go to the right, you'll find the prophets. And a really small book tucked in there is the book of Jonah. He's one of the minor prophets. This is Jonah, the prophet. And the title of my message today is Failing to Flee from God. Because Jonah will try to flee from God. And as we saw in verse 4, God does something to stop him, catch his attention, and turn him around. And so we're going to be in Jonah the whole chapter one today. But I don't know how many of you know a lot about the book of Jonah. Maybe when I say the word Jonah, immediately the image of a giant whale comes into your mind. And if you're like me and you love biblical accuracy, you're like, it's not a whale. It's just a fish, right? Okay. Um, Some of you are like, that's just, that's messing up the Sunday school story. I know. I asked my kids, I'm like, is it a whale or a fish? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, maybe they don't know the difference yet, but... It's not a whale. It's actually a great fish. Um, And a lot of times when people get to like this whole idea of Jonah being like caught in the belly of a fish, the fish goes down. Actually, God sends the fish to go get Jonah and he he swallows Jonah. Jonah's in there for three days. A lot of people go, all right, I'm going to stop right there. This is a little crazy. Uh, I can't believe that story. All right. But there's actually one story in the Bible that's a little bit more crazy to believe than someone being alive in a fish for three days. It's called the resurrection of the Son of God. And if we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day, we can believe that Jonah survived in the belly of a fish for three days. And Jesus actually mentions 
the story of Jonah in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 45. It's the sign of Jonah, the corrupt generation that needs to turn and repent. And Jesus believed that was a, a, a true story. He taught about it in the book of Matthew. But Jonah, it's, it's unlike any of the prophets. So there's a lot of books in the Old Testament. In fact, it's, it's the law and then the writings and then the prophets, or the law, the prophets, and the writings. And the prophets are, take up a lot of the Old Testament when it comes to some of those little small books. And really, prophets, what they do is they get words from the Lord, and then they speak out against a situation that's going on in society. Basically, this is the reason why life is like this way, so you need to turn and get back to God. But Jonah is unlike the other prophetic books because there's no title. There's no introduction. It just starts off with basically saying, now the word of the Lord. This isn't a collection of oracles spoken out against other nations or against the people of God. Like Isaiah has 66 chapters of oracles and same with Jeremiah and Ezekiel, some of these bigger Old Testament prophets. What we have here is a story. In fact, it starts off with the word now and that usually in Old Testament literature like triggers the idea of this is the start of a story. And so we have a short story about Jonah. And so scholars have been trying to label it with a certain genre. Like what kind of a story is it? And really you could maybe say it's a parable. And a lot of people will connect this to the parable of the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15. And Jonah um, in, in the first two chapters acts like the younger son who says, you're dead to me, I'm going to leave and squanders everything. And then the second, two, second half of the book, chapters three and four, he kind of acts like the older brother in the, par- in the parable of the prodigal son who, who goes and does what God says to do, but is mad because God has grace and mercy towards someone that he doesn't want to have grace and mercy toward. So it's a story. It's, it's a parable. And it's, it's filled with overstatements. Like for this little book, it's packed with a ton of intensity. In fact, we're going to see the word great or big 14 times in 48 verses. It's the great city of Nineveh. It's the big city. It's, it's a big storm is thrown um, onto the sea. And, and it's exceedingly strong. In fact, my translation I'm preaching out of today is the English Standard Version. It says that a tempest is growing more tempestuous. Like, that's supposed to be very intense, all right? I had to look up what tempestuous meant, all right? But That's just, you know, another story for another day. But there's an intensity about this story. There's a ton of words packed in here to, like, bring about the emotional uh, passions within this story. It's a little story with a huge amount of intensity. So what's Jonah all about? Is it just about a whale or a great fish? No, not at all, actually. It's about a conflict between a prophet of Yahweh, the Lord, and the Lord. There's a conflict between God's prophet Jonah and God. Jonah doesn't like something about God. In fact, he can't stand it about God. In fact, it makes him angry to the point where in chapter three and four, he talks about, I just want to die. At the chapter four, he says, I just want to die because he doesn't like something about God. And what is the thing that he doesn't like about God? He doesn't like how God feels for the city of Nineveh, for the great city, Nineveh. Jonah can't stand. It makes him so angry that God would feel something for an enemy of Israel, for a, for a capital city that's known for its, its violent crimes against humanity, for almost like a terrorist state, if you will. And, and Jonah can't stand that God wants to have mercy and grace and compassion on the great city. He doesn't like that about God. He can't stand it to the point when when the word of the Lord comes to him, what does he do? He tries to flee. He gets away. That's not a good prophet. A little side note, good prophets don't run from God. Good prophets receive the word of the Lord and fulfill and follow out God's call in their lives. Jonah doesn't like God's heart for the city. And that's kind of the subtitle of our series for the next four weeks is God's heart for the city. God wants Jonah to feel for the city what God himself feels for the great city of Nineveh. Are you ready to jump into Jonah chapter one? For the five of you. Yeah, let's go. All right. I've been away for a couple weeks. I'm ready to preach. Watch out. And I've had an energy drink and a cup of coffee. So here we go. I'm raising two boys, right? All right, here we go. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. If I have trouble saying that word, just give me a little grace, okay? 
Tarshish. All right. From the presence of the Lord, flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. They want us to know that he's heading to Tarshish. All right. Three times. Three times. All right. So Jonah, right? We're, we're met with this character, Jonah. His name means dove, all right? He's the son of Amittai, the son of faithfulness, son of truth, which is funny because he's not faithful at all in this passage. In fact, he's, re- he's reluctant, if anything. And he's not so much the peace-giving dove that he's supposed to be. Maybe in the words he ends up saying, but here right now in chapter 1, he is anything but his name is supposed to say. We don't know much about him, but we do know in 2 Kings chapter 14, Jonah is the prophet who gives a word to Israel and says, you know what, God will be merciful to deliver Israel from their enemies and will establish a new national boundary under King Jeroboam, who did so much evil in the eyes of the Lord. But the one thing Jeroboam did do that was kind of marked down as okay, King Jeroboam, is he reestablished a national boundary for Israel. Because God said he would be faithful to Israel. And so Jonah was the one who prophesied that that would happen. He's known for his kind of the the national um, heritage of Israel. He's known for that boundary. He's known for, for coming through when Israel needed a place to call their own. Regional, national boundary. He's the one who prophesied it. And here it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This is a revelatory encounter with God. This isn't just... Um, hearing or having a speech or a conversation with God. This is something powerful. When, when the word comes to Jonah, it's not spoken to him. It's not said out of a donkey. Right? It comes to him in a presence. And when the word comes to Jonah, it brings about the idea of, again, of being made to, um, to think God's thoughts, to adopt God's ways, to feel God's passions. When the word of the Lord comes to a prophet, it's supposed to change them so much that they actually fulfill the word that comes to them. And they become the mouthpiece of God for the people. But it's interesting because he said to do what? Go to Nineveh. Arise. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, arise, go to Nineveh. Prophets are supposed to speak prophetic words sometimes they say like woes against nations, but primarily they're supposed to give words to the people of God. So Jonah's very different. I want you to go to that great city. I want you to go to the pagans, to those other people. I want you to go proclaim something against them. And it says that, that um, their wickedness, their evil, or you could even translate it as their troubles have come up to God. The implication is God doesn't want trouble to come on the great city of Nineveh. It was a great city, a major metropolitan area in the Assyrian Empire. And Assyria was one of the cruelest, one of the most violent empires in ancient times. The kings would brag about how they they decimated cities and, and how cities and corpses were burned. And the kings would brag about that. And at this point in history, mid 8th century BC, Assyria had already flexed its muscles against Israel and became an enemy of Israel. So you can understand partly why Jonah would not want to go and preach against it because troubles had come up to God. Jonah's probably like, glad, I'm good. I'm glad they're about to fall. I'm glad that, that uh, Nineveh is, is going to you know, be, be plundered because look at what they do to this world. Because when they go around and when they flex their muscles, they take women and children and they take livestock and they take them and they kill all the men and then they take those people back with them as plunder, as loot. And Jonah has an issue with God because he doesn't want God to have a heart. For Nineveh. God doesn't want trouble for the city. God doesn't want the crying out that's happening to reach him. God doesn't want this city to fail. We're going to learn a little bit more about that later on in the book of Jonah. So what does Jonah do? It says, so Jonah fled to Tarshish. I said that three times, right? Where is Tarshish? It's like saying the ends of the earth. It's like Brandon, yes, yes, Lord. All right, arise and go to Seattle. So Brandon went to Miami, all right? Like, it's the complete opposite. It basically, he went to not Nineveh, all right? As far away as you can. In fact, they can't even, like, locate Tarshish geographically in those times. It was kind of just known that you would go to a port, and then you would go to Tarshish. It was kind of like the land unknown. Like, when you get there, they're like, People actually went there, but it was so far away. They don't know where it was regionally, but they knew like this. When you're saying, I'm going to Tarshish, it's like I'm going to the ends of the earth. I'm gone. I think 
my football coach used to say like, hey, what are you doing way out there in eastern Budapest? Like that's kind of the idea. Like that's so far out. Like what are you doing? They're at the ends of the earth. And Jonah, a prophet of the Lord, he says, arise, go to Nineveh. It says, Jonah flees to Tarshish. He goes to not Nineveh, as far away. He never talks with God. He never expresses his doubt or his anger or his fear. He just goes and flees to not Nineveh, to Tarshish. He goes down to Joppa, to a port town south of modern Tel Aviv on the Mediterranean Sea and buys a ticket. You ever notice when you want to run from God, usually like everything seems to like, like the plans of the evil one are like right there. Sure, there's a ship. It's ready to go. You have the money for the fare. You can get on the boat and go. Like, hey, that's great. Run from God. We'll make all the plans easy for you to get there as fast as you can. Verse 4, though, is interesting. It said, The Lord hurled a mighty great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest. So here's all the intensity. A great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? <laughs> He's a sailor. Like, I'm sure he said other words all right, in there, but... Um, Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. I love it. Jonah flees from God, runs, tries to get as far away from God as he can. And God creates a storm on the sea to stop Jonah, to catch him, into his, tra- in his, catch him in his tra- tracks and to turn him, to get his attention. Jonah's disobedience, though, now endangers everyone on the ship. These mariners, these were seafarers, again, sailors, if you will, but they were, they were used to storms on the sea. But this one was so violent. It was so tempestuous. All right, we're going to get there in a second. It was so violent of a storm that they were worried. And when the storm hit them, I love what they do. Well, we must pray to some kind of a God. And what does Jonah do, the prophet? Well, I'm just going to go down further into the ship. I'm going down to Joppa. Now I go down to the innermost part of the ship. I'm going to go down and lay my head down to sleep. A prophet who's supposed to have passions for God and want to do what God would want to do is doing the opposite. Now he finds himself asleep in the bottom of the ship and the sailors are in a way acting more godly than Jonah. Like, we need to cry out to God when a storm's hit my life. I'm going to start praying to God first. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And Jonah is fast asleep, wanting nothing to do. No emotion whatsoever. He's just sleeping. God feels something amazing for a great city and Jonah wants nothing to do with it to the point where he is now at the bottom of a ship sleeping. And they said to one another, verse 7, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. That was just a way in which God would, would kind of show his like, wisdom back in the Old Testament. Uh, the Israelites would do that as well, cast lots, and, and God would show them something. So that was something known in the time, and it fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you like? This is crazy. You brought this storm, this huge tempestuous tempest, all right? I'm, I'm not gonna, that's not going to get old in my book, okay? But you caused this. Who are you? Where are you from? I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Like the men, the sailors, they get it. Does Jonah really fear God, fear the Lord, the one who made? No. And they get that. What have you done? Like, If you're a prophet, you're someone who fears the Lord, why is this storm coming upon us? Then they said to him, again, what shall we do to you that the sea may go quiet, might make quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. There it is. I told you it was in there. Verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. There it is again. Okay, I'm not making up that word. It's right there. Verse 14. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish from this man's life and lay it not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Jonah was supposed to fear the Lord and 
They realize, no, you really don't fear the Lord because you're running from him. This has caught, because you don't fear him, this storm has come upon us. But now it's these, these foreigners, these pagans, these mariners and sailors, they're the ones who's actually confessing faith in the Lord. They feared him exceedingly. Again, that word great or big, exceedingly. It's in here. It's intensity right now. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They're sounding more like prophets than Jonah is. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The belly of the great fish. It's interesting. Jonah does for the sailors what he doesn't want God to do for the city of Nineveh. He's willing to lay down his life. Throw me overboard so you can be saved. And that's what God wants to do for Nineveh. He wants to save them and deliver them, bring them a word of warning because God's, God acts in grace and mercy. That's his heart for the great cities. And Jonah doesn't want to do that for them, but he does that for these sailors, even though he doesn't want that. Now the great fish, all right? This is a way in which God is doing similar to the storm. He appoints a fish to swallow Jonah to now graciously rescue Jonah to get him back, make him come back to his senses, if you will. And there it says that he is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, some of you might be like, oh, there's, that has to be a reference in some way to Jesus. And again, there's a bunch of different ways you can look at this. And yes, Jesus is by far a way better Jonah, if you will. But, but we'll get into that a little bit later on in the story. The big thing here I want us to take away is that Jonah is trying to flee from God, but he failed because now the, the fish has him. The storm got him and now the fish has him. So what about this can we learn for ourselves? What's some truth about running from God? Here's your little fill in the blanks. Give you a chance to talk about them during life groups this week. But here, running from God and true encounter with God demands a serious response. Part of our vision statement for our church is we are, we are people who encounter God, who grow together and love God's people here in our church, in our city, and around the world. But the encounter God, we believe that, that our life in Christ all starts from the encounter with God. And here Jonah has an amazing encounter with God. The word of the Lord came to him. But this encounter demands a response. And Jonah took the Lord very seriously. So yay, Jonah. All right, but he was very bad because he disobeyed God. So really there's two options when you encounter God. You either follow God's call or you flee from God. And Jonah chose the worst. Another way to say it is obey or disobey. But I wanted to use alliteration, right? Follow the Lord or flee from the Lord. You either obey God or you disobey God. Jonah took the word of the Lord so seriously. Good for him. However, he refused to talk with God. He refused to work it out. God, maybe give me some idea of of why you would want me to go to Nineveh. Why do you care about the trouble that's come up to you for this great city? Remember, a true encounter with God demands a serious response. For those of us who have met Jesus and are following him, remember his call to be a disciple, you must do what? Anyone who would follow after me, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, about you know half a year ago, all right, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must do what? Deny themselves. Take up the cross and follow me. If you've had an encounter with God, it shouldn't just make you feel good and walk away. It should demand something from you. It should demand your whole life to follow after the God who was willing to lay his life down for you. Have a true encounter with God, to know his thoughts, to have his heart and his feelings for other people. That's what it means to encounter the Lord. And a true encounter will demand something very serious from us. Ultimately, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to give him your life. There's no gray area with the Lord. It's either all in or it's all out. And here Jonah is faced with the same thing. Am I going to go all in and follow him? And instead he decides to flee. And then, which leads to the second point, running from God's call is really just running from God. Running from God's call, arise, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against the great city for its wickedness has come up to me. And Jonah is really just fleeing from God. The book of Jonah, like I said, is about Jonah's conflict with God, his unwillingness to come to terms with God's heart, the way God feels for the city. Up to this point in the story, Jonah's lack of trust causes him him to refuse God. 
Again, if you really trust God and what God would send you on or how God would call you, if you really have a trust, a deep, solid trust in God, then you can follow through with whatever the call is. Because it doesn't matter because you're, you're doing the call because of the one who called you and the one who sent you. So Jonah's running from the call of God, but really he's just running from God because he doesn't have enough trust in God. He doesn't have enough trust in the goodness of God, the wisdom of God to tell Nineveh to turn and to repent and to come back to the, to come to the Lord, to turn from its wickedness and its troubles. Jonah doesn't trust that in God's sovereignty, he knows what he's doing. And so Jonah runs from God. Again, it all comes down to trust. If you're willing to follow God, if you're willing to obey and go all in and deny yourself and take up your cross, it's all because you trust the one who's calling you to do that very thing. One of my favorite Bible verses in the Old Testament is Proverbs chapter 3. Now, if you have this on your mug, more power to you, because this is one of the ones you put on your mug, all right? Coffee mug at home. It's Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Jonah did not trust in the Lord with all of his heart. He actually leaned on his own understanding of Nineveh. Remember, he preached against, he preached against Israel, or preaching for or prophesied that Israel would establish a border. He doesn't want the enemy to now repent. For him, his own understanding, why would I go to my enemies? I actually want them to perish. Have you seen what they've done to different cities around this world? Have you seen how they've killed the men, taken the women, the children, and the livestock back? I'm saying livestock because in week four, it's, gonna, it's all going to come together with you. All right? He gets that. And he doesn't like that. He doesn't want to go and preach because he doesn't trust in the Lord and the goodness and the mercy of God for God to have something in plan for Nineveh. Jonah would rather do his own thing and run from God. But the sad thing is, in the story, he endangers all of those sailors who were on the ship with him. Because point three is, sin always has a storm attached to it. Sin always has a storm attached to it. A tempestuous tempest, okay? (laughs) It's not really funny, but it's true. Sin, his disobedience, his rebellion, his fleeing from the call of God, it has a storm attached to it. And that is true for us today. But I'm using the word attached for a reason. In fact, when I was reading a book from Timothy Keller on the book of Jonah, he, he makes this point as the storms are attached to sin. And I want to be, be clear that we're saying attached because there's a difference between storms attached to sin and storms as the punishment for sin. Because a lot of us could still go, oh, well, so you know that the hurricane that hit that town, well, that was because there are such evil people there or something like that. I've actually heard people want to see storms hit um, San Francisco a lot when I was living in California. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty divine and wrathful. And I don't really know if God works so much in those ways. But the point for, for Jonah here is that as he's running from God, there's a storm that, a literal storm that comes. But for us, when we sin and we disobey, a storm is attached to that sin. Attachment means there's a consequence from saying no to the will of God, a consequence for refusing to follow through with God's will. Because sin doesn't just affect me. It affects those who I'm in community with as well. And we've all seen that, right? I mean, sin might feel good for a moment, right? You have maybe have some, someone does something to you, and so you have like some, you know, some retribution or vengeance type thoughts, and mm, it feels really good if that would happen to that person. Mm, yeah, but then if you continue to let those thoughts play out, now you become bitter and resentful, and you're full of hatred and anger and rage towards someone. It felt good for the minute, but now there's a storm that is brewed and it's attached to you. There's an interesting verse in the book of Numbers, all right? Some of us don't ever read the book of Numbers, all right, for you know, a number of reasons. Um, there's a good pickup line there, but I'll leave that out because um, my wife isn't here. But um, anyways, it's like, have you, I was reading the book of Numbers and I realized I don't have yours. Okay. All right. I went to Bible college. Like those are the jokes, right? Okay. Numbers chapter 32. I'm back whether you like it or not. Okay. Numbers chapter 32 is... God is talking to the people and he says, if you fail to do this, this will be, you will be sinning against the Lord. And here's the warning. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. And isn't that true? When we disobey the Lord, like we seem to 
hit the consequences of, yeah, sure, you've been forgiven. And yes, if you're in Christ, like it is no longer counted against you, but you still have to feel the effects of your sin for time to come. In fact, James talks about like, it's actually like a, like a sin is like a birthing process. Like you have this evil desire and then like it grows and then it's birthed and it leads to death. It's almost to the point where like, you have to now deal with this sin for a long time and sin will re- literally have the end of you and will lead to your end. But as point four in our sermon notes today says, in the face of sin and rebellion, God's radical grace still pursues his people. Jonah is clearly sinning against the Lord. He's clearly disobeying. He's clearly fleeing from God, and that's his rebellion. He is literally going to the ends of the earth not to follow through with God's call on his life. Tarshish is the end of the earth. And yet God in his grace sends the wind, hurls the wind on the sea, and a tempestuous tempest starts to brew. It's becoming more and more tempestuous. All right, it's the last time I say that. And finally, the great fish. God appointed a great fish to go and swallow Jonah. These are all acts of God's grace and God's mercy to stop a prophet that's running from God. A prophet who is in his sin and rebelling and going away from God. And that point is that in the face of our rebellion, God's grace still pursues his people. That is true for us today. In Romans chapter 5, it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, in rebellion, fleeing from God, ungodly, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Rebellion, powerlessness, powerless to save our situation. We're ungodly, we're, we're sinners. Romans 5.10 says we're enemies of God. We were enemies of God before Jesus died for us. And it's in that moment, while we are sinners, while we're in rebellion, that Christ died for us, died for you and died for me because God's radical grace still goes after people. There are 120,000 people in Nineveh who need the grace of God. So get up, Jonah, and go preach to Nineveh. Get up and go. My grace needs to reach more people. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. Because earlier he says you're dead in your sin. And when you're dead in your sin, you cannot be alive because you're dead. And so God made you alive with Christ. It's by grace you've been saved. This is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, in the, in the midst of our rebellion, Romans says we're all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We, we all don't measure up. We're all enemies of God before we're reconciled. We're all sinners until in when Christ died for us because God's radical grace, in spite of our rebellion, will still pursue us and still reach out to pull us in for a relationship because God has a heart for people, a heart that's full of grace and compassion and mercy. That's just Jonah chapter one. We got, two, we got three more weeks, all right? As we close today, I want us to reflect on, on back on that, um, the initial conflict between God and Jonah. And maybe we can just close our eyes in reflection here just to think about this. Because remember, Jonah can't stand God's grace and God's mercy and God's feeling toward the city. Jonah, in fact, is enraged by God's compassion. He says it in the very end. He's angry and he hopes actually that he would die. Because <laughs> he doesn't want God to be merciful to Nineveh. So with our eyes closed, I want to ask you questions. Are you fleeing from God right now in any way? I want you to name it. I want you to trust this is a safe place to say, yes, I am running from God. I'm fleeing from him. I'm trying to flee from him right now in this way in my life. Second question, is there something about God that you do not like? Is there something about the character of God that rubs you the wrong way? And name it. Number three, what about our city? Do you dislike and want to be judged? Can we be honest in there? What about our city? Do you dislike and want to be judged? 
And four, who in our city needs to find Jesus and needs to find the eternal life that is only found in him? Who in our city needs Jesus? Name it. And let us together say, Lord Jesus, we will deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. Help us, Lord, to have your feelings for the city. Lord, help us to understand your heart for the city, your longing for people to come into relationship with you, your love for your people, Lord. Help us to understand your grace and mercy. And Lord, let us be generous in how we offer it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I let you out a little bit late. All right, just trying to match Pastor Daniel. And um, he did a great job, by the way. I've been really thankful for him stepping in and, and always, uh, always being the solid pastor that he is. And so, um, yeah, on your way out, go grab a cookie, some coffee, and give someone a high five who might also be running from God, too. You never know. No, I'm just kidding. Have fun in Tarshish, all right? Head there. We'll see you next week.